Good morning, Year 7. Uh, today we're carrying on from our last lesson on Henry VIII and the Reformation, and we're going to be looking at the dissolution of the monastery. So hopefully you should be able to see my slides now. Uh, it says, were the monasteries corrupt? This is our big question for today, and we're going to break that question down um, in our keyword section in a moment. Um, so our keywords are dissolution, monasteries, corrupt, and relics. And as well as the big question, by the end of this short video, I want you to be able to answer these questions. What's the difference between open and closed religious monasteries or religious houses and what do you think the main reason was for the dissolution of the monasteries in terms of our skills today we're looking at cause and consequence so keywords and the definitions you might want to get these down and pause the video to write down so when we say dissolution it's it means like like dissolve and um, so when we and when we're talking about dissolving the monasteries it means to get rid of so if you imagine if you put um, salt into a glass of water it will dissolve it will it will look like it's disappeared um, so that's what the thinking is um, with that with that term the dissolution of the monasteries now when we say monasteries they were a religious house where monks live and work so um, monks um, you will see from this picture here these are some medieval monks now I know there have been some bad lockdown haircuts you might be rocking one yourself at the moment but maybe none of them quite as bad as um, what these um, monks are working with um, so monks they devoted their whole lives to God to prayer to Christianity uh, so they would li they would live together in these monasteries um, and, and the same applied for, for women as well there were there were convents where nuns would live um, and we will look at over the next couple of slides about what they actually did there. Most of their life was dedicated to prayer um, and to reading ab about God, um, but they also, in, on some occasions, did things in the community as well. Now, corrupt is our other key word. So you've probably heard this word before. Corru if you're corrupt, it means you're doing things that are dishonest or illegal um, in order to try and gain something, maybe gain money um, or maybe to gain some power. Um, and this is imp an important word because Henry VIII, he said that the monasteries, that the monks had become corrupt. Um, and then finally, relic, um, an idea we, you might have heard of before. It's, it's um, an object or like a bone of um, a saint or somebody religious and it's considered holy. Um, it's considered that it's a really special thing to have and that you can receive a blessing if you have it. So at this time in the church, um, a, a monastery um, would be seen as really important if it had something belonging to um, a saint. A saint would be an important religious figure um, in Christianity. Okay. So this is Henry VIII um, on the left. Don't get confused between the two of us. Very different men, very different ideas. Um, so Henry became king in 1509. We've looked at, um, we've looked at what he did um, because he wanted a divorce. We've looked at him setting up this new church, the Church of England, in our last video. And if you haven't, you can pause it and go back onto that one. It's called the Reformation. Um, but when he becomes king, there were 850 religious houses in England and Wales. So religious houses, it doesn't just include monasteries. Um, it includes buildings like friaries, abbeys, convents. But we don't really need to worry about that. For this lesson, we're going to call all of those religious houses monasteries monasteries. Now there are two different types of religious houses or monasteries. Some are open and some are closed and your first task is going to be to explain the difference between. So make sure you're concentrating and you might want to be taking some notes as we go through. So um, closed religious houses first, they were completely closed to people outside of that monastery or religious house. You couldn't, you couldn't go into it. They didn't really serve the community. The, the, the monks um, in there, they, they just would pray. They would sometimes um, sort of copy out um, Bibles because obviously there's no, um, there's very little um, printing press at this time. Um, so they would copy out, um, they would copy out bits of the Bible, but they weren't really serving their community. However, there were open religious houses um, and where the local monks and nuns would provide for the community. There were, there were no actual hospitals at this point, um, so they are caring for the sick. They're also providing education um, for boys. And also they, they also provided some education on rare occasions for women, which was really surprising and, and, and quite controversial at that time because um, women's education wasn't seen as a priority. But some of these monasteries were providing that. So the open religious houses that are providing for, the, for their community, they were often very poor because they're spending all of their money on serving the community, on helping the sick and on educating people. However, the closed orders, they became very, very rich. And they did this because they weren't paying anybody 
to work for them. They would have volunteers, um, people from the community would come in and support them, but then they were still becoming very, very rich because they would receive money um, because people wanted to give to the church. So they are getting very, very wealthy, but they're not providing a service to people. Um, so um, it is these places that are frequently referred to as monasteries. Um, and they owned about one third of all of the land in England and Wales. Okay, and so it says that there's a fact here. It says the 30 richest monasteries were as rich or richer than the wealthiest lords in the land. So these closed monasteries, there are, there are some of them that are becoming incredibly wealthy. And if you think back to our lesson on Henry VIII, what is he going to be worried about? We know he's a very jealous man. We know that Thomas Cromwell, his advisor, was in his ear saying... I think you should. I think you should be more powerful than the church. He would be. He would be worried about how rich and powerful the Catholic Church was. So, first task. Then I want you to explain the difference between open and closed religious houses. You can do it in a couple of in a couple of sentences. Pause the video or do it at the end and come back to it. Okay. So this is Thomas Cromwell. We've mentioned him quite a few times already, and he was a key figure in our last lesson. Um, so by 1535, Thomas Cromwell was running the church for Henry VIII. Hopefully we remember that Thomas Cromwell is not a Catholic. He is a really strong Protestant. Okay, He was the one who was telling Henry VIII, you should really think about setting up your own church. We should break away from this corrupt Catholic church. So in 1535, he told a group of men um, to go and visit all of the monasteries in the country, all of these religious houses, and report back to him on what was going on. And what I want you to do is I want you to take on the role um, of um, Thomas Cromwell and you're going to report back to Henry on what is being um, on what is being um, what is happening in these monasteries. So I'm going to show you in a moment. I'm going to show you some sources, um, really important in history. I want you to read through them. You can pause the video, or if you've got access to Google Classroom, this slide is all on. These slides are all on there. Pause it and and try and craft your argument of what is going on in the monasteries that might suggest that they are corrupt that they are doing things for their own power and not following their rules. So you've got some sentence starters for you there um, to help you. Um, you could frame it into your lordship um, and you could use those sentence starters if you want to, but you don't have to. You can, you can be creative and, and use, your own, um, use your own structure. Um, and also a tip, um, when you're reading through your sources, words like convent and abbey, they're different religious houses, different religious buildings, and abbot is the person in charge of an abbey, and mass is the name for a Catholic church service. So here are your different sources. Pause the video, have a read through them, and try and work out if there's any evidence that the monks might be misbehaving, that they might be not following um, the rules that they should be, and that might suggest that they are corrupt. I'll give you an example here. This is writing, writing about a nun at a place called Lampley Convent. It says, Mariana Wright, a nun, had given birth three times, and Johanna Snaden was also a nun, had given birth six times. Now, you probably know, monks and nuns, they're supposed to devote their life to, to Jesus Christ. They are not allowed to start their own families. So they're, they're, not, they're being shown here that they are not following um, their rules. It's a suggestion that they are corrupt. Have a read through the rest of the sources um, and fill in your report. Okay, so far we've looked at some of the reasons that maybe the church might have been corrupt, that maybe the monasteries did deserve um, to be dissolved. However, it's history. There are always two sides to the story and we need to sort of balance out what we've heard. So it has to be said that getting rid of the monasteries, dissolving the monasteries, created huge benefits for Henry VIII. So one, remember, he's just set up his own church and the monasteries are controlled and owned by the Catholic Church. So it removes the power from the Catholic Church and it also questions their holiness. We just showed some examples um, on the last slide, people um, not following their actual orders of people um, having children. Um, it suggests that they are not following God's ways. so that weakens the Catholic Church in England. And on the flip side, that makes his church stronger. His new Protestant church, the Church of England, it looks like um, it might be following the rules because it's trying to stop had the Catholic monasteries um, from breaking them. Um, they also had these Catholic books which, um, um, which had been carefully um, hand copied over time, probably over months and months it would have taken them to, to, um, to copy those out. But those Catholic books were burned because Crom Thomas Cromwell and Henry VIII, they would not have wanted Catholic ideas to spread across England. How else did he benefit? 
So you can see here that Henry VIII was preparing to invade France. He wanted to invade France and he wanted to start a war, um, which became known as the Siege of Boulogne. Um, so in order to do that, um, he, um, he needed lots of money. So the land um, was taken from the church and sold off or given to some of Henry's closest allies and friends. The relics that we've spoken about, those, those bones and bits of clothing that belonged to saints, they were stolen and sold for lots and lots of money. Even the lead from the roof um, of each of the monasteries was taken and, and melted down to create gunshot or bullets um, in order to support this, this war um, with France. So this is from a modern history textbook. It says Henry's normal income before 1536 was about £100,000 a year. But once he'd done the dissolution of the monasteries, between 1536 and 1547, he received an extra £140,000 a year from closing the monasteries. So he has more than doubled his money each year just by dissolving the monasteries. So when we're saying why they were closed, part of it might be that they were corrupt, that might be part of the reason, but we can't ignore the benefits that Henry VIII has experienced, the fact that he is now so much wealthier and he's removed the power of the Catholic Church. So this is your third task then. You're going to write a P paragraph for me. Um, the task is, based on what you have learned, why do you think Henry VIII decided to close down the monasteries? So you've got some sentence starters here on the left-hand side to help you. Um, so your point, the main reason that Henry VIII closed the monasteries was, you could say, because of their corruption. You could say that they were corrupt and use some of the evidence from your sources. On the flip side, you could say the main reason was because Henry VIII wanted money. Um, or he wanted to get rid of the power of the Catholic Church. Choose one of those. Okay, You don't need to write one for each of them unless you really want to. Choose one of those, uh, those points. Then give your evidence. For example... Um, you could talk about something like, for example, the nuns were getting pregnant or um, there were the, the monks were getting drunk to show that they were being corrupt. You, for e um, evidence of money being important, you could talk about the fact that um, he was able to sell off, um, sell off the relics that were found in the monasteries or the fact that he was able to use the lead on the roof um, in order to um, create gunshot um, for his war with France. And then you need to explain it, explain the consequences um, of, of that action. So this meant that Henry was able to start his war with France. It, it meant that he was able to strengthen his new church, the Church of England. That's in, in a couple of sentences in that explained section, that's where you show that you have really understood what the consequences were um, of that decision to dissolve the monasteries. Okay, so that's your three tasks. Take your time on that and try and get those different sections of point, evidence, and explain. Just a reminder then of your three tasks. Explain the difference between open and closed religious houses. Two, use the sources on your sheet to write up a report for Henry VIII, which tells him whether the monasteries were corrupt or not. And three, what do you think was the main reason that Henry VIII decided to close down the monasteries? All of that work, if you've got access to it, needs to be handed in via Google Classroom before Friday's deadline, um, Friday at 12 p.m. midday. Um, if you've got any questions, um, please, there's a function to do that on Google Classroom, or you can email your teacher, and my email address is at the bottom there, um, rwilliams1 at bluecoatbeachdale.uk.com. Last thing then, um, because... In the news at the minute, you've pro you probably will have seen that there's a lot about protests, about people standing up for what they believe in. And I think it's it's a really um, interesting time. You might have attended some of those protests yourself, like the one on Sunday um, that was on Forest Rec um, for Black Lives Matter. And I wanted to link that into something that was happening around this time called the Pilgrimage of Grace. And this is when Catholic people, so remember, the, the ordinary people um, of England, they well, most of the majority of them were Catholic and then all of a sudden they've been told to stop following that church and to start following a new one. And imagine if somebody said that to you. Imagine if you are if you are religious, if you're a Christian and somebody said, actually, you need to follow a different kind of religion to what you've been brought up with. Even if you're not religious, imagine somebody saying that the thing that was one of the most important things to you, you can't do it anymore and you have to change. It would be really upsetting. And so a group of people um, 40,000 people, led by a lawyer called Robert Askey, they, um, they led an uprising, they led a protest, a rebellion, where they said, I'm not going to stand for it, this is, this, is, this is wrong for you to dissolve the monasteries. Um, and um, it started in Yorkshire, in the north of England, um, which is where a lot, if we look at English history, a lot of um, rebellions have come from the north of England. Um, and 
Sadly, the rebellion was crushed. So Robert Askey, who led it, um, he um, and 200 others were executed. They were killed for their role in this. I thought as a little extra thing, you don't have to submit it. You could maybe do some research on the Pilgrimage of Grace, see if it's something um, that, that interests you. Do it as a mind map, do it as a... As a, um, a um, a piece of artwork, whatever you want to do. You don't need to submit it. If you want to, please do put it on an email to me um, and I would be happy to, to take a look at it. Okay, um, hopefully your work for this week makes sense. Um, like I say, any questions, please do message on Google Classroom or on the email. I hope you have a fantastic week and I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye.